Well, I welcome to this talk on basic reproductive number. Now, this is one of the concepts we need to understand if we're going to understand the nature of transmissible diseases and how diseases can spread through a population. So the basic reproductive number is called R0, and that's how it's pronounced, R0. Now, what the R0 does is it tells you the average number of people who will catch a disease from one contagious person. So this is the nature of transmissible disease. One person has the disease and they spread it on to one or more other people. And the number of other people a particular individual spreads the disease on to is the R0. Now this is going to vary for different individuals. So this is an average over a population, the R0 value. How transmissible is a disease? How is it spreading through the population? And this assumes that we're spreading into a population with no previous exposure to the antigen. Now, the antigen is a virus or bacteria which is causing the infection. It is antigenic. It is what the body recognises as being foreign. And in response to that, the body will make immune proteins called antibodies. So the antigen is spreading, the virus or the bacteria is spreading through a population with no previous exposure. And because someone has no previous exposure, this means that they will not have any antibodies. They will not have immunity to this virus or bacterium because they haven't been previously exposed. And of course, if you haven't been previously exposed, you haven't developed any antibodies, you've no immunity. That means you are very vulnerable to the disease. To you, to you it is a new disease. You haven't experienced it before. And the thing about this antibody antigen thing the antigen stimulating the production of antibodies is that they are specific to a particular virus. So if you are immune to one bacteria, that's not going to make you immune to another bacterial illness. Or if you're immune to one virus, that's not going to necessarily make you immune to another virus. In fact, it's very unlikely to make you immune to another virus. So this has to be done on a specific basis. So that's what the antigen and antibody reaction is. We're assuming that people have not been exposed to the antigen. So assuming no pre-existing immunity through exposure or vaccination. And this reminds us of the two ways that we can get these antibodies, that we can get this acquired specific immunity. One way is by suffering the infection with varying degrees of clinical manifestation. Or the other is that we're vaccinated against it. And this is the whole point of vaccination, that we get the antibodies, we get the immunity, but without having suffered the disease because the vaccine is something which fools the body into thinking it is the disease. Make, well, it, it can be parts of the disease. It's attenuated versions of the disease that won't make us sick, hopefully. And this stimulates the body into making antibodies. And then when the real virus or bacteria comes along, the body recognises it because it's been vaccinated. So just before we look at these numbers here, let's just look at what we mean by this in a practical example. So if the R0 of an infection is 2, so in this example we see an R0 of 2. So we start off with one infected person, and that one infected person on average infects 2 more people. Then that infected person on average infects 2 more people. Then that infected person on average infects 2 more people. So we can see it's 2's all the ways here. So one person here infecting 2. And then one person there infecting two. And then one person there infecting two. And then one person there infecting two. So the R naught is two in this case. But this means, of course, that we're going from one to two to four to eight to 16 to 32 to 64 to one to eight infected cases. So that's if an R0 is 2. Now, if the R0 is 3, so in this example, R0 equals 3. So on average, 3 people are going to be infected per infected person. So here we have one infected person infecting 3 new people. So that one person there is infected 3. And then that one there is infected 3. And then that one there is infected three and that's the way it goes or well, we could take it up here that one person there's infected three and that one person there's infected three like that so 
here the numbers of course of growth are much greater 9 27 81 two four three seven two nine great much greater rate of increase here so we see this r naught value is absolutely critical to understanding how quickly a disease can spread through a population and how many people can infect other people and this is a very important concept here this r naught one whether the r naught is greater than or less than one so just to focus in on this if r naught equals one then that means each infected person is infecting one other person. So one person infects one person. And then hopefully the person who was initially infected, who infected the second person, gets better. Of course, they could die. But basically what that means is the one infected person is replacing themselves with one other reflect, uh, infected person. So that means the number of cases if r0 equals 1, is going to stay constant. So that would be r0 equals 1. The number of cases are staying constant in this case. They're not increasing. Now, if the r0 is greater than 1, then that means that each infected person is infecting more than one other person. And the r0 could be 1.1 or it could be 1.2, or it could be 5, or it could be 12. All, all of these situations, each infected person is infecting more than one other person. And that means the number of cases will rise. So the number of cases will increase. So that line would there would be R0 is greater than 1. The number of cases will increase. But what we need to do in infections to stop the spread is to get the R0 below 1. So if the R0 is below 1, that means on average, each infected person will be infecting less than one other person. So that means the number of cases are going to go down and hopefully eventually the, dis the disease will disappear. So that line there would be R0 equals less than 1. So there are the three possibilities really. R0 is 1, in which case everything will stay as it is. R0 is greater than 1, in which case the numbers of cases will rise. R0 is less than 1, in which case the number of cases will fall and hopefully eventually go down to 0. Now, what are the factors that determine R0? Well, R0 is determined by several factors. And some of these factors are biological and others of these factors are non-biological. So the R0 is not an intrinsic property of an infectious disease, of a virus or a bacteria. It depends on partly the biology of the virus or bacterium, of course, but also on how many people an infected person comes into contact with. So one, one determinant is the infectious period. And this is how long an infection is contagious for, how long someone can potentially spread. Contagious means someone can potentially spread the disease to others. So for seasonal flu, for example, this is typically up to eight days. So with seasonal flu, someone is going to be contagious, able to spread the disease to others, usually for a day or two before they get the features, before they get the clinical features, and for some days after they get the clinical features. In children, it can take longer, up to two weeks, probably because in children they haven't been previously exposed to similar viral flu infections, influenza infections, and it takes them longer to mount a full immunological response because the immune system has no previous training to this particular flu or influenza antigen. And the longer an infection is contagious for, the higher the R0. So length of contagion during any particular condition is going to tend to increase the R0. So that's really a biological factor. That's due to an interaction between the infection and the host, the host being the person that suffers from the disease. Now, contagion rate, how many people an infected person comes into contact with? So we have a person with the most infectious disease in the world, but they're isolated on a Pacific island. 
then they're unlikely to spread it to other people because they're not coming into contact with other people. Because by their very nature, these diseases are transmissible. They must be passed from one person to another. So the R0 will be lower if a person stays at home and isolates themselves, or if they live in a remote location, whereas the R0 will be higher if they have more interactions with other people, more interactions the, the nature of those interactions would depend on how the infection is spread. But the more interactions they have with other people, the higher the R0 will be. Now, another factor is the mode of transmission. And this is important because this influences the shedding potential of the virus or the bacteria. Now, the shedding potential is if I'm an infected person, how many viruses or bacteria am I giving out into the environment through my breath or through my body fluids or whatever it is. How infectious am I? What's my shedding potential? So this is important. So for example, with HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, the shedding potential is reduced with antiretroviral uh, anti drugs that prevent the multiplication of the virus, the uh, RNA virus that causing the acquired immune deficiency syndrome which is the human immunodeficiency virus. So the shedding potential is a factor. How many viruses I'm giving off. And that's going to vary, of course, from disease to disease. And it's going to vary depending on how much the disease is suppressed. Another good example there is tuberculosis. This bacterial infection where people can be coughing up bacteria, infecting other people. And again, with treatment, the shedding potential goes down quite dramatically after the first two or three weeks of treatment as the treatment starts to suppress the multiplication of the bacteria within the body of the infected person. So the shedding potential is one important factor. Now, if the virus or the bacteria is airborne, then there can be a very rapid mode of transmission. So rapid speed of airborne. So flu or measles, for example, can spread through a population very, very quickly because it's droplet and can travel in the air between individual people for a metre or two, probably further in the case of measles. And no physical contact or fomite is necessary. Now, a fomite is something like an object. So if I'm an infected person and I touch this pen or these days quite commonly a mobile phone, and then you as an uninfected person pick it up, you catch the virus or the bacteria from my pen, this pen has become a fomite. So a fomite is an object which actually spreads the disease. So rapid speed of airborne, flu or measles, no physical contact or fomite necessary. Now, these droplet infections can spread directly from person to person or they can go via a fomite. So these can actually spread via both modalities, but a fomite is not actually necessary. Or a fomite could be a cash line machine where someone has coughed on and they use it and then you come and touch it with your fingers and then you contaminate yourself with that but that's not necessarily required if it's airborne because it can be direct from person to person in the air but it can also be through a fomite so that will give us a rapid mode of transmission as people are shedding the virus into the environment but there's a slower transmission rate if it's spread by body fluids so for example Ebola hepatitis B or C, human immunodeficiency virus, are spread by body fluids. Now, in the Ebola outbreak, one of the big problems was uh, care of the dead. Uh, people that died of Ebola, the funeral rites often involved uh, infecting those that were taking care of the funeral rites, and that had to be altered. But hepatitis B and C and HIV are famously sexually and serum transmitted. So they're transmitted by body fluids. So they're transmitted by cervical secretions in, uh, in sperm, in the seminal fluid at least. And hepatitis B and C are often transmitted through sharing dirty needles amongst intravenous drug users. Or appallingly, I'm uh, sad to tell you, uh, there are many cases where these diseases have been spread by bad quality, negligent healthcare. So the mode of transmission there is going to be a big factor in the R0 as well. Let's give some concrete examples of this so we can uh, see how this really relates to practical epidemiology and preventing the spread of infections. 
So seasonal influenza is a droplet infection. It goes in, the virus goes into the droplets that someone is breathing, coughing or sneezing out. And the R0 varies depending on the virus because there's a slightly different version of the virus, usually influenza A that's causing uh, seasonal influenza. And the virus varies from year to year. So the R0 is typically 0 0.9, which is good, which means we'd have a very limited outbreak. Or it can be as high as 2.1. So sort of 1.6 is probably typical for seasonal influenza. Now, the 2009 swine flu outbreak that you might remember, that was an H1N1 influenza virus. That was a droplet infection and the R0 there was in, in that kind of range. About 1.5 people were infected on average from each infected person. And this is reasonably accurate because this was worked out after the event where you can examine how the infection increased in prevalence quite accurately by looking back at the data. Hepatitis C is uh, spread in body fluids and the, the practical R0 there is about two, largely because it's spread through intravenous uh, drug users. Uh, hepatitis B and, and HIV, uh, hepatitis B is, is probably similar, although hepatitis B is more transmissible than C sometimes. It's a separate topic. Right, Ebola. Um, hepatitis B is much more transmissible than HIV as well. E Ebola. Uh, body fluids, the R0 was 2. Trouble with Ebola is the case fatality rate was so frighteningly high, so the consequences of getting that disease were really quite serious. Now, the 1918 influenza pandemic, 1918-1919 uh, influenza pandemic, spread around the world and killed 50 to 100 million people. It was a quite appalling outbreak. And that was a, it was a influenza A, it was an H1N1 uh, influenza virus, actually. And that killed between, uh, the, the R naught there, the, the rate of spread, it killed an awful lot of people, but the rate of spread was 1.4 to 2.8. So probably figures around about 2, 2.2 are typically quoted for that. So again, a high R naught, uh, partly explaining why this was a pandemic and spread around the world. HIV, uh, spread in body fluids. Uh, that's got a high R0, but that's largely because of uh, behaviour. Um, people often having multiple sexual partners or because of um, people sharing multiple needles amongst intravenous drug users. Now, smallpox, a, a wretched scourge of the past that hopefully that's now thankfully been eradicated from the world. That was a droplet infection with a high R0, quite a transmissible condition. Mumps, which is infective parotitis, droplet infection, between four and seven R0, so quite high. Pertussis German measles, the R0 there's 5.5, quite high. But then one of the most infectious diseases around is measles, which is airborne, uh, droplet and airborne. And the R0 there can be up to 18. Figures of 12 to 18 are typically reported there. Now, having said that, there's a phenomenon called super spreaders. Because remember this R0 figure is actually an average. So really, we're only going to know the R0 at the end of an outbreak, at the end of an epidemic or the end of a pandemic, looking back, looking at the growth of the infection and seeing on average how many people were infected by an individual on average. But the way this actually works in the real world is that some people are super spreaders. And I suppose you could say the converse of that is some people are mini spreaders. And this is often... In many pandemics and outbreaks, this has followed what we call the 2080 rule. And this means that 20% of infected uh, individuals are responsible for 80% of the transmission. So this 20% with the initial infection results in 80% of the new infections. These people are super spreaders. So whereas the 80% it is only infecting 20%, isn't it? So the 80% is only infecting 20% of the new cases. So the problem can be these super spreaders and identifying these super spreaders is a big challenge for epidemiologists. But if we cannot find them, isolate them, we're going to reduce the spread of an infectious disease. So pretty crucial that we, uh, we test people to find out who these super spreaders are. Now, the biological reasons behind super spreaders is not particularly well understood. It might be partly genetics. It might be that they've had a large dose of the virus. 
Um, it might be that their immune system has sort of partly combated the virus, but not enough to eradicate it and they carry on shedding the virus for longer. But for whatever reason, or it could be behavioural, of course, these could be very gregarious people. Or in the case of HIV, these could be very sexually active people. So it depends on the nature of the virus, but this is what's often seen, that it is a, a minority of infected people who cause most of the infections in the uninfected or previously uninfected people. So this means, as well as the uh, overall reproductive number, the r naught, we need to consider the individual reproductive number. And that's going to vary very much between individuals, because some are going to be super spreaders and some are going to be mini spreaders. But overall, we're going to get an average R0, which gives us useful information about how, tra how the disease is being transmitted through a population which has not been previously exposed to that disease.